Good evening, all. Welcome to our second virtual 2021 Naturalist Night speaker series. My name is Olivia Dice. I am the Restoration and Stewardship Coordinator at Wilderness Workshop. Thank you all for being here this evening. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the Tabwatch Ute Nation as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Prior to colonization in the 1800s, countless generations of this nomadic tribe followed both herds and the weather, establishing summer camps located throughout what we call today the Roaring Fork and Colorado River Valleys. If you know whose land you're occupying at the moment, please share that via the chat as well. If you don't, I encourage you to learn about the history of your home and its stewards. Naturalist Nights is a free speaker series in the Roaring Fork Valley offered through a partnership between Wilderness Workshop, the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, and Roaring Fork Audubon. Naturalist Nights have taken place for 10 weeks every winter for over 20 years now in both Aspen and Carbondale. We're very excited to be continuing our learning together as a community this evening. We would also like to thank our generous sponsors that help make our Naturalist Night series a success. These businesses provide financial and in-kind donations which help cover expenses and make Naturalist Nights possible. The next virtual presentation will be live online in two Thursdays on February 4th at 6 p.m. Lucretia Olson, an ecologist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, will be presenting on Sharing the Same Slope, Can Canada Lynx and Winter Recreation Coexist? And now it is my great privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Susan Sikiakwaptiwa. Susan serves as the assistant agent for the federally recognized tribal extension program at the University of Arizona. She serves the Hopi community by providing and organizing practical education, agricultural programming, 4-H and youth development and family health and consumer sciences. She was born, raised, and still lives on the Hopi Reservation in Northern Arizona. Along with her husband and son, they ranch cattle, raise hens, tend to their large vegetable garden, and dry farm fields, which we will all be learning more about this evening. It is my absolute well honor to welcome Susan to our 2021 Naturalist Night series. So at this moment, I would like to welcome Susan onto our screen. How are you doing tonight, Susan? Good evening, everyone. It's so great to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. It looks like we have over 60 people joining us on Zoom at the moment um, from all over the country. And your audio and video is coming in loud and clear. So with that said, take it away, Susan. Thanks again for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak about something that I really love and um, that I just could talk about all night. I only, thank gosh, they only gave us an hour because I could keep you guys here longer. Um, I'm coming to you from my home as well in Northern Arizona um, on the Hopi Reservation. The little town is called Second Mesa. We are about 200 uh, miles as the crow flies east of the Grand Canyon in the north um, northeastern part of Arizona. Um, you'll see photographs of the landscape um, that we that I come from. It's probably different than where you are, but it is a high desert region. And I'm going to be speaking about merging traditional and modern growing methods for food sustainability. This is um, a life and a very intentional work that I've been doing now for the last 20 years, for pretty close to 20 years. Um, well, it's led me to, to do this work now pretty, pretty closely in the last five, but it's been a great ride, so much fun. And um, I'm always just so happy to share the work that I've done and, and you know, try to bring along people with me too in this journey, because it's, it's an important topic for all of us. Um, she mentioned that, uh, Olivia mentioned that I serve as a federally recognized tribal um, extension program agent. And that's really just a tribal uh, program that's the same as a, an agent found in cooperative extension. It's just dedicated to tribal people. Um, every tribe can choose to have an agent. Um, it's a separate funding situation than other extension, but we're all connected to the land grant universities of, um, of our state. So I work for the University of Arizona. Um, I have 18 years of growing 
vegetables, food um, in, in my region. And I, I say that because growing food is very different depending on where you live. Um, I hope we have some gardeners in the audience tonight and people who grow. You're my kindred spirits. You'll probably know what I'm talking about as I visit with you tonight. Um, but it's, it's really led me on this beautiful journey that I'm on. So as, as Olivia mentioned, I grow uh, a lot of vegetables, a lot of food. Uh, we through irrigation, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean when I say that, because we also have another method called dry farming. Uh, we grow a lot of food that way. Um, I used to have my own cattle herd and my own ranch. Um, it was on the, on the eastern side of the reservation. My husband had his ranch on the opposite side, on the western uh, side, and we we would say, oh, "Which side of the uh, ponderosa are we going to this year?" And I tried, I tried that joke on a, some young college kids. They had no clue what I was talking about. <laughs> so uh, it was just a lot of a lot for to run two different ranches. So um, I preferred the younger, smaller animals like hens and and sheep. So we gave up my ranch, and now we just ranch his his um, his cows. When you grow food, you you really do automatically become a food preserver. Um, it's just part of growing food. You have to learn how to savor and keep all that as much as possible. And you also automatically become a seed saver. That's usually the next step that happens. It's just for an organic process of growing food. And so I am still learning so much about those, those parts of um, the food uh, production line. And I just teach as many people as I can about what I've learned. Um, I do have a certificate in organic growing and I choose to grow organic methods um, and through all that experience and knowledge I then teach and share. Um, I'm also trained as a fa professional facilitator so I sometimes facilitate as part of the work but really my job has been a wonderful of um, reconnecting people to the food sources that they come from. Um, about Seven years ago, I made a, a commitment, a personal commitment to try and grow as much of my own food as possible. And that really set me on a different trajectory of, of learning and growing. And um, I've now tracked some of that work, um, my personal work on my Instagram page, which is listed on this sheet if you care to follow um, hereafter. So tonight we're talking about food sustainability. And so what does that really mean? Um, what does food sustainability mean? It's a huge, huge overwhelming topic and we're not even, we're just gonna barely touch the surface tonight, but I really wanted to talk about or kind of set the stage about what we mean when we say that. And most of us begin with knowing that it becomes, it, it starts with the food that we eat, um, the food that we have, um, do we have enough good food is actually all the qualifiers related to food. Is it good? Is it healthy? Is it affordable? Is it accessible? Um, that's usually where we start when we think about food sustainability. But when we really look at what it means, it means a lot more. It means how is your food produced? Where is it grown and how is it grown? How is that food distributed? Uh, we have something called food miles or we can even we can actually track carbon related, the carbon input into the air with where and how far our food um, is, is moving to get from where it's grown to where it's actually purchased. And in the case of Hopi, where we have to leave our home to go and actually purchase the food sometimes as well, going back to that store. How is that food packaged? And what does that do to the environment? And then kind of at the end of the chain, oh, how is it consumed? Um, so really it's, it's, it's a big, big uh, picture when we talk, when we really get into the nuts and bolts of food sustainability and we're not unfortunately gonna to get too deep into that. But, um, and I'm going to give you more of a lens of kind of the Hopi perspective. But food sustainability has implications all over the place. We can, we can come at it from a healthy standpoint. You know, is the food I'm eating healthy? Do I have enough? I talked about the cost of healthy food access, um, economic implications, you know, is the farmer making enough? Uh, the people who pick and, and clean and get it ready for, for packaging and uh, purchasing, you know, every person that touches that line down the road, um, what does that mean for the food dollar that you spend? And of course we have the larger environmental implications. And those are just three huge larger um, areas of, of 
<laughs> issues and challenges that we can come in contact with when we talk about food sustainability. So some elements of sustainably growing or to grow sustainably, um, when you look at from a farmer perspective or from a grower perspective, their goal really is to maintain and increase output, meaning I'm gonna try and grow as many tomatoes or whatever it is you're growing, while increasing the environmental benefits at the same time. So you really have to begin thinking much bigger and broader than just your yield of a tomato. How can I think about other things? And some of the other things that they might think about would be understanding your um, ecosystem, your environment and the surrounding ecosystem. When we say ecosystem, those are the, the plants, the plant life in your, in your region, the insect life, the bird life, the habitat that um, surround the areas of where you grow um, and the protection of those these ecosystems and the plants and animals. Is there anything you're doing to harbor uh, danger to them? Or are you doing things to help support those, um, their life? Um, protecting and building soil fertility, huge element for organic growing. You're actually doing more for the soil than you are growing food. That was a big shift in my head. Uh, but how can we, what can we do with the practices that we're doing that's gonna actually help build or protect the fertility of the soil that we have there? Um, and then looking, in, looking forward in the future, what am I doing now that's gonna support my growing efforts in the future? Um, I plan to grow for at least 50 years. What can I do that's gonna support that, that long? And even maybe my grandchildren doing the same thing down the line. Um, of course, avoiding the use of artificial fertilizers and pesticides and utilize, utilizing more organic or natural methods to do the same thing, to fertilize the soil or to um, manage pests. This is just a, you know, a drop in the bucket of some of the ways in which generally we talk about sustainable growing methods by, uh, for farmers. But let's, let's jump a little bit more than now closer to where I'm from. Uh, what does food sustainability mean today at Hopi? Because that's really where I'm coming to you to share, share with you what I do and how I approach the work that I do. Uh, this is a picture of a landscape of a dry farm field. And um, this is my field actually that was planted by my husband and managed by him. It's beautiful. This is um, the, the first third of the planting season. The corn is coming up nice. Um, you can see it's very dry and it's very brown. And that corn, the green of that corn just sticks like blurts out color. It's the really only color and everything else is monochromatic. But the Hopi culture, the Hopi people are an agrarian culture. Our lifestyle, our religion, our philosophy, our outlook is all based around the idea of farming. So um, farming is actually is it, we're, we're, we're taught and we're told and we're ingrained that it is a destined purpose for us as a people, um, that we are meant to be farmers. We are just destined to live in this environment and be farmers. And that's tied to a stewardship principle that we believe um, is also the, the connection and real reason of why we are here today in this world and while we are brought into this world. So farming connects us, connects us to the stewardship um, responsibility that we feel we have to help steward this earth. And if we think about it in that really simple terms, it's a beautiful, beautiful, powerful um, purpose that we can, that we have. In order for us to achieve this in, a, in this pretty dry environment that we have. We get less average, less than 10 inches of rain a year, um, even less in the last 10 years because of uh, the droughts and certainly climate change. Um, it really does take a cooperative way to work and live amongst each other to be self-sustainable in this environment. And Hopi really was self-sustainable until probably close to the late 1800s, 1880s, 1890s we started to see a big shift. That's only a little over a hundred years ago. It's not very long ago that things have drastically changed. Cooperation is still a shared cultural value and we see it all the time in a lot of the cultural things that we do. However, that shift has changed so drastically that today we have, um, you, you really, and all of us actually have, are in the same boat. Today, you have to choose to live sustainable. 
to sustain to live sustainably you have to be intent and purposeful to decide you want to live that way and we are in the same boat even though we come from this beautiful culture that has all these beautiful teachings and we have this land base and you know we we still we are in a situation where we have to choose to live this way the reasons I just list really quickly are, you know, there's plenty of lifestyle options today now for everyone to choose from. Um, we are not isolated. We are well connected, as I am with you tonight, through this Zoom opportunity of reaching people in, in your area. Uh, there is actually now different, our lifestyle has changed where there's cost of supplies and materials and different things related to growing um, any kind of food, including this level of food. I mean, it can, it doesn't have to be, but it can. Um, you have to access the heirloom seeds to be able to successfully grow the food the way we grow it here in this dry farm method. You cannot grow food from with seeds that do not connect to this environment. The seeds and the method have evolved over time and actually hope you believe that we were given these seeds in order to uh, help us survive. But today, um, a lot of people like to have access to the seeds, but they don't grow the same way because they are not connected to the environments that, other, that are outside from our area. Time, how many of us can all talk about the time of, that we need for anything and everything? So if you choose to, to engage in this uh, practice, you have to make the time, you have to have the time. Um, and then, of course, knowledge, because there's a lot of um, knowledge that that you only learn by doing. In Hopi culture, you learn by doing. You don't sit there and take a class. You don't read a book. You go out and you do it. And it takes years, for, of course, for anything, anybody to master anything. So um, I just bring I bring I bring this to you because I think people know about the Hopi uh, or maybe some of you know about some of these cultural ways, but we really are in a precarious situation today in, in how do we continue to move forward for ourselves um, when it comes to food sustainability. I would like Olivia to open up the chat right now and just have you all put some notes in there for me. I'd love to hear about this, um, what you thought, and there's a question at the bottom of my slide. Have you thought about food sustainability in your own life? Um, and what areas of your life promote or support the, that idea of food sustainability? I just gave you an, an idea of what, um, you know, of, of um, how my culture might, might support that. But just give me, if you don't have anything to share, that's fine. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to look at some of the chat questions. Um, but if you have anything to share, you can certainly drop that into the chat and just let me know what you're thinking. And if you don't have any answers, that's okay too. And I'll come back to that. Just remind me that there's, okay, that there's a check. Sometimes I forget those. So I'm gonna stop that again really quick and just, so somebody says, oh, Lee, Lee, thank you for coming um, all the time. We, I think about it all the time. I integrate it into the community, arts practice, encourage others. Encouragement is, and support is huge. That's like half my job is just doing that, encouraging and supporting others. Buying organic and local, going to the local farmer's market, having a veggie gardening. Yep, grow. I can't grow my own food, but I can't, all my own food, but I can grow heirloom tomatoes. Woohoo, anybody can do that. You're, you probably have a lot of good best friends too, I'm sure, because everybody loves heirloom tomatoes. Planting perennials, very good idea. Uh, growing lots of vegetables and caring for a fruit orchard. Supporting local biodynamic forms, very cool. You guys are really, you know, eating and, and as organically as possibly possible, limiting meat intake. Great. Supporting local farmers as much as pod possible and eating with little waste. Very good. Thank you for sharing those ideas because um, the, the way I teach also is like I, I'm here sharing with you what I've learned, but I've learned that of course, I only know this much, you know, and we learn really from each other. And part of what this whole idea is to help us create this community and reconnect us because we all have answers to each other's um, challenges. Let me jump into some natural gardening trends. Um, uh, growing food over the last 10 years, it has shown that we, there's been a huge interest in gardening on a national scale. 
Um, in 2007, it was reported that backyard gardens increased by 35%. And that was an, and in, since 2008, backyard gardens increased um, over 200%. So it's been, it's just been exploding. Uh, the, some of the research has also shown that younger people, thank heavens, younger people are the ones becoming farmers versus what used to be the older population growing food. So thank you for all those young people who are interested in it and, and dipping their toe in the water and trying it out. In 2018, we had record sales of almost $50 billion just spent on home gardening sites. This is like, you know, the big box stores and all the small places. I mean, lots of money have been spent in this area. Um, I love this quote by Dennis Patton, who's a extension, who works with Cooperative Extension from Kansas State University. He says, history has shown that when a crisis occurs, there's an increase in home gardening, um, home uh, vegetable gardening. And the 2020 pandemic that we're in right now, uh, well, the pandemic we're in, and last year in 2020, we've seen gardening increase like crazy. Three top reasons. Um, people want, still want the availability of fresh vegetables. And the best way to do that is try and learn to grow your own. People are staying home. They finally have time to go outside. They have the time that they didn't have before to actually start gardening and growing food. And people want to do something with their children because guess who's home with them? All our children are home with us. So how can we do something together? Um, those are all great reasons. So thinking about that larger situation and then bring it back to Hopi again, um, this is a, a picture that was just taken a couple weeks ago. It's a morning picture of really what my environment looks like as well. It's very uh, dry and brown, beautiful, open skies. Uh, we have roughly uh, 8,000 residents on the Hopi Reservation and we are located in what's known as a high desert landscape. We're roughly around 5,000 um, elevation, uh, 5,000 feet elevation. The reservation is roughly the size of Rhode Island. It's pretty spread out, um, but we are we concentrate ourselves within little villages. We have two grocery stores that offer basic amenities and three other convenience stores. So that's really the, the extent of which our food access, if, unless you grow your own food, um, is, is what we have available to us locally. Most people travel to border towns, which in our case would be Winslow or Flagstaff, Arizona, for groceries and other service. And the average one-way miles to any one of those towns is about 70 miles. So 140 just to get there and come back. That's not even counting the time and the expense. Um, but the Hopi Reservation is considered a food desert, which means it has an area that has limited access to nutritional and affordable foods. So food deserts is another new term that's come out recently, and it kind of means it, it doesn't really mean it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, amount of food. It's really about the access and cost of nutritional good food for people. Um, in 2004, we have a local nonprofit uh, called the Hopi Foundation. Uh, they have a program called the Nutwani Coalition that focuses their time and attention on dry farming and, and encouraging and supporting that whole effort in our community. But in 2004, they conducted a Hopi food assessment. That data is now 17 years old, and they're actually instituting a new, uh, updating that data. We have a survey going right now to update that um, information. And there's a lot more information that they that they got from the survey, but I'm just going to give you a few crazy tidbits that came out of that, that assessment. Regarding food economy, the total Hopi food economy that they found from that assessment is between 18 and $22 million. I about fell out of my chair when I first learned this. Uh, to be able to understand and see, I think, numbers and this high of a number of, of what is spent on food in our in my community alone is, is mind boggling. The second big, um, another big note <laughs> is Hopi people spend $7 million just to transport food to our community. And that's the, the, the miles I talked about of driving to and from the border towns mainly. Uh, so 
if you add in the extra $7 million that's spent, we actually pay a premium on all our food costs um, of 66% more than the average consumer. So if we are far off the track of food sustainability and, and you didn't believe that, this should help with changing your mind. They also, the, the assessment also um, looked at the farming industry currently in our community. And it showed that less of the third of the respondents continue to farm or less than a third of the respondents continue to farm. It really showed a decline. Um, it put some numbers, I guess, behind what we could visually see um, when you drive around the community and talk to, to people. Um, many of the respondents said that the youth were not interested in farming, that they didn't see that the youth were interested in farming. However, the youth, the people who identified themselves as, as youth stated that they were interested in learning to farm. Um, they just didn't know quite how to go about it. So there's that tells us there's a disconnect between our elderly and our youth community when it comes to the just um, the notion of farming. So there's a lot more data that they uh, produce and they're, they're working on updating this. And I have some resources at the end that shows you where you can find more of this information, but it really was um, a eye-opening assessment on, on what we kind of knew, but never really had some hard and fast numbers. And it was a big shock. This is what drives a lot of the work that I do aside from just my big heart and my interests, but you know, this should drive any community work that we do. Some of the Hopi trends, um, we're still dry farming. It's still happening. Uh, our community interests align with those national trends. There's other organizations who are all coming together to promote self food self-sustainability. Um, local foods, um, there's a whole bunch of other activities that have come out in the last five years. The Hopi Food Co-op, the Farmer's Market. We've just tested a Hopi Community Supported Ag Program in the last two months. Um, and we're extension is all a part of trying to, uh, along with the others to help make this work. So as I kind of came forward, I was looking to how do I support self-sustainability and local growing? I had to ask myself some questions. How does my community approach growing food and food access? Where am I, or where are we as a community? And also where am I already doing? What, what's happening? What do I not have to do or what what's not happening that I should be doing, who can I partner with? Because extension is very poorly funded. There's one, now we have a part-time staff. It's just the two of us. So, you know, there's always way more work than people and resources. And when you look at growing at the food, the traditional food sources of Hopi, there's, uh, there's two methods of growing food. One I mentioned is dry farming and the other is irrigated growing. And I'm gonna get into both of these a little bit more here. Ranching and hunting. Hunting is more the traditional method for gaining meat source, but we also are cattle ranchers. We have at least uh, very close to 200 ranchers who all ranch mainly beef, cattle. Um, and then we do a lot of foraging of wild foods um, and also trying to re reteach or reintroduce people to, to that, that piece of um, food um, access. But dry farming really is, as I mentioned before, is, is, is culturally entrenched, it's very rich, it's steeped in tradition and religious practice, um, it's so connected to the seed heritage, um, and it works. There's, there's very little that we can really do to, 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 to even change what's happening because it just works the way it is. So there's no reason for us to kind of go in and modify that. Where, we're, where I'm spending most of my time is, is the irrigated growing practice. We, we have that as part of our culture, but it's been less, um, it's, it's, it's been less done over the last several years. And those methods are where I can um, begin to in, infiltrate or introduce or um, share new methods um, that are not necessarily traditional, but can begin to help uh, spur, how can we do this better? How can we learn together? So that's where I'm finding most of my work happening. Um, just to start really quickly to share with you a little bit about the dry farming. Basa, that's a Hopi word, which means it refers to the larger fields that we have out there. And that's um, where we where we grow the dry farming uh, um, uh, products. Some of those products are corn, 
we have 16 varieties of traditional corn, but a lot of people grow blue and white, um, and there's a sweet, a sweet corn variety. There's about seven, six different types of beans, um, a couple lima beans, some tepary beans, some common beans. Those are all grown well and do really well here. Uh, we even grow watermelons, dry farmed, um, pumpkins, and some summer squash. Those really need a lot more heavier rains. They're harder to grow now because of the drought we're experiencing. And we have a lot of fruit trees, apples, apricots, pears are some of the more common ones, um, grapevines. And a lot of what we see with our dry farming area is you grow a lot and you eat very little fresh and a lot of it's preserved. So food preservation is a big part of our traditional growing practices because that was how we survived over the course of the years, winter year, winter months. We dried everything. We live in a dry environment. Everything just shriveled up. It was easy to do. Um, so some of the ways we support dry farming is to maybe introduce um, ideas of windbreaks. The Hopis already conduct windbreaks or make windbreaks, but how can we look at using different materials, for example, or looking at um, um, just, you know, those are just an, an idea. Wind erosion. Um, there's a wind is a big factor in our area so we look at ideas of what causes that how can we modify some other practices so that we can manage that a little bit better the biggest pest are crows uh, they eat your watermelons they just know when they're ripe they eat your fresh corn they're very hard to manage but um, understanding them better is some of the, the the ways in which we would offer some of that work Irrigated plots, Zilvasa, <clears throat> that's what we call them in Hopi. It really means a chili garden. Um, that's where we used to grow a lot of chilies. And a lot of those plots traditionally were by spring sources because some of these plants need a lot more water. Um, there's still some villages that grow near the spring sources, but now today we see a lot of people growing uh, backyard gardens. These have moved from the spring sources to backyard gardens. So some of the staples people still grow. I put hot peppers or hot chili. Um, people around here are like, why would you even grow bell peppers or sweet peppers? What's that? I don't get it because we love hot chili. So people love jalapenos, Anaheim's, um, summer squash, zucchini mainly, onions and tomatoes. Those are probably the four things that everybody grows. People will also maybe plant beans, radishes, some corn, things like mint and watermelons. We're starting to introduce and see uh, people grow asparagus. Uh, well, asparagus kind of grows in one community that has a lot of water, so they're more used to that, um, that, that plant. But when we move to the eastern part of the res, it's, it's still a novelty, but some people are starting to grow asparagus, uh, garlic, Swiss, chale, Swiss chard, kale, and potatoes. And everything else below that line, are, I mean, I grow everything on this page, but, and there's probably like five to maybe 10 people that grow almost everything on this page. So there's very, very few growers who are looking beyond the basic things, but, um, but we're here to tell you that it can grow and we're here to show you how to do this. So part of what we do is, is you know, um, the, best play, the best way to, 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 I guess, inspire someone is for them to see it. You can talk about it till blue in the face, but until they come and pull their own asparagus or broccoli or whatever it is, strawberry off a vine in the neighbor's yard, that's next to you, you're like, wow, I didn't know we could do this. So part of this is providing that inspiration and proving that we can do this. But people start with what they know and where they are and you have to meet them there. The, this is a dry farm field of beans. This is a little bean plot. And this is a classroom for a lot of our young people. Our young kids are, are taught growing the dry farm methods, since, especially the boys since they're young and um, they learn they learn this as just part of cultural life ways. Um, it's not a class, they just go help their fathers and grandfathers. But you'll see dry farming is, um, look at the field, it's very dry, it's very bare. You can see the edge of the grass. So there's a designated area. Um, it's very, it's considered, the farmers know where they're choosing this because there's water runoffs, there's soil types that they're, that they're paying attention to but they don't plant unless the soil is moist. And that requires winter snow and spring rain for that soil to be moist. So all gardeners know that year round, you're thinking about your garden. It's not just in the middle of the, 
of the growing season and, and Hopi farmers very much fall into that area. They clear an area if it's not already cleared in spring. They plant airy loom seeds very far apart. You'll see the little tiny bean plants at least, I don't know, seven, six feet apart. Uh, they water, they don't water, the, 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 the earth waters through rain, but they manage the weeds and manage pests. We harvest um, some and eat, I mean, we harvest all, but we eat some fresh and we preserve most. And then you lay the plants down at the end of the, when the season. So this is how most people will start their vegetable garden. They'll clear a field and they'll put a transplant usually um, of tomatoes in a bare plot like this, six feet apart. And so you're like, and that's how I started because that's all I knew. And I understand, so you, you have to, you just start with what you know. Today, what we teach is we, we bring them along and we show them with irrigated growing today, we designate a plot. It has to be near a water source because these plants can't survive without just rainwater. So where is your, where's your hose connection? Because you wanna buy a 500 foot hose or a 50 foot hose. That's a money difference and a management difference. You have to clear the area. You have to fence off. Unfortunately, we got a lot of dogs. Do you want drip line? Do you even know what that is? We're creating beds, we're building soil. You can plant seeds or transplants. It depends on what the plant. Do you want to learn how to make transplants? Mulch, 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 mulch. Big part of what we do for a lot of reasons. Uh, we do manage pests because um, pests like tomatoes, uh, the pests for tomatoes are different than the pests for beans. Um, they're not the same pests. So you have to learn what those are. And then teaching people how to harvest. Some, if you've never grown um, asparagus, for example, how do you know when to harvest? Or if you've never grown onions, when do you harvest them? So just really learning um, those basics and then building upon that. And that's just the summer season. Now, if you want to extend, this is what we're doing now. We're actually putting warm weather, tomatoes, a warm weather crop, we're planting them in March here. Um, you have to have a lot more knowledge and experience to figure out what it, what to do. So it's a whole different way of growing. And, and people are like, oh, I thought it was going to be easier because all we had to do was add water. And you can, you can just do that if you want, and you will get a tomato and you will get a chili, but you will get your yield and your, um, all the other things we talked about, about building soil and uh, creating enough to, to preserve all that is built into, um, trying to get them to I basically could get more bang for their buck, especially if they're paying for the water that they're adding. Um, so some of the things we do with extension um, is to teach those classes. We offer a lot of free workshops. We have um, my friend Mario here on the picture. He's teaching uh, uh, some facilities guys from Second Mesa Day School and elementary school how to prune fruit trees. About 10 years ago, um, the school was um, given a whole slew of fruit trees to have a huge fruit orchard in their, in their school, which is a, an amazing, wonderful idea. But the turnover for the facilities guys is, is pretty high. So we're constantly teaching people, them, them and their staff, how to manage the fruit trees, which is fine because they probably have fruit trees at their home too. So rebuilding that capacity of knowing how to manage uh, the food sources we have is a big part of what we do. Um, here's a flyer from workshops we had last year, water bath canning, that's part of our preservation series. Um, and then the gardening series, which we did in the late fall, um, seeding transplants for fall. People could not imagine doing that three years ago. Now we're talking about having a full garden. Um, importance of mulch, I tell you, I can teach mulch all day long every month and still not have say it's that it's that important and then preparing your garden for winter how can we use our winter months to continue to build soil and all those things over the full you know while we're just um hanging out in our warm house so these are just some examples uh, we also build uh, demonstration projects hopi people and i'm sure your community members are like this um they just have to see it to believe it. You can talk to them till you're blue in the face and tell them this is possible, this is what we should do, but they won't believe you until they see it for themselves. So we built a couple hoop houses. Um, so this helps with, for us in our area with wind protection, our winds are really are terribly strong and especially in the spring. And our sun is actually very, very strong. Uh, so growing things like lettuce and other greens is really helpful if you have a shade house to grow them in.
Um, but if you show people how to build them, if they're part of building it and if you help them grow in it, then they understand, wow, I didn't realize how much food I can grow in this small space. We actually trained three young Hopi um, young adults to build these <clears throat> as part of our work. So now we have three trained people who can help more community members build this. In the front, in the middle picture, we have ag fabric. Um, it's a type of fabric that's used to help um, give a little blanket, some of you growers might know it, or shade, depending on how you wanna use it. We use them in our area to seed carrots and beets because we do those in the early spring, but it's still very dry and hot. And those seeds need to stay moist to germinate. So this helps keep that, um, and the mulch sometimes too heavy. So anyway, there's a lot of good reasons. I'm not gonna go into it because I can talk to you guys about it all night. But um, we have things like uh, also just Following back to our tr food traditions, we already had things um, called adnaya in Hopi, and those are work parties. We, we still have work parties when it comes to planting, when it comes to cleaning, when it comes to any kind of big effort in the community, we call people together and we have work parties. And so part of this is what we do when we, when we teach our, our classes. Um, the three gals sitting with me, um, they already know how to clean garlic. Um, but one of them said, I love to come. I haven't done it in a while. Let, let me come and help you. But we were working with 10 other youth um, who were learning a lot, a lot about growing food. And this is the first time they'd ever seen a garlic plant. They didn't know what garlic looked like. And they, they cleaned, I don't know how many pounds of garlic that day. And we got it all done in one day. They learned how to do it. We fed them a good lunch and they all went home with their own little stash of garlic. And that's how, that's culturally how we incorporate our work based on the work that we do as Hopi people. On the right, the young kids are reseeding carrots and beets. I grow carrots and beets in the same bed. Um, they're all root crops and, and um, so I, I grew them, not them all, they didn't all germinate. You can see all the huge spaces out there. So they came in and reseeded carrots for me and beets. And this is the first time they ever even seen a carrot seed, a beet seed. They didn't know what they look like. So they're getting to learn. Um, they've, they've done it. They now can do it and they can actually go home and practice and actually do it at home. So these are some of the things that we're, we're really proud of and, and how we teach. So how can we all work to become more self-sustainable? You answer that question at the very beginning, grow some of your own food and start with anything, like take out a house plant and put in a tomato plant or basil, you could do that. Um, I won't say it's easy, but we could start there. Support local growers, buy or trade local, support your farmer's market. Select or save seed from growers in your area. This is huge. We can all go to seed catalogs and buy seeds, but you'll know that that seed has begun to build a relationship with your environment. And it's begun to understand your elevation, your climate, your water sources, all those things. And that just creates a stronger seed. So begin to save seed if you haven't thought about it. And then seek ways to preserve your own food. Um, there's so much fun things you can learn when you begin learning about how to preserve food. And growing food is something you can do as a family with your children. I always, always haul my son out. This is my son and his, um, his first cousin, my other daughter. They're six weeks apart. They've done everything together. They're learning how to plant onions. They're, they're prepping the garden to plant onions here. And so we're moving all the mulch and they were finding different kinds of worms. And so they're asking about worms. And so there's just so many like teachable moments you can have with your children when you learn. I mean, when you put them in this outdoor classroom. So here are some websites um, of some of the organizations that I mentioned. Um, uh, the Not Winnie Coalition, Hopi Disco Permaculture Institute, which is a wonderful program. The Hopi Food Cooperative. Um, we just have a brand new website. Um, the Hopi Farmers Market, we have a Facebook page. And the least exciting website on this list is my website, Cooperative Extension. But that's where you can find me if you need, um, need to reach me. And then once again, I'm just leaving you my Instagram um, link if anybody cares to follow me and, and let me know if you're a gardener. I like to follow you too, because that's really, really how we learn and, and grow together. So I'm gonna end here and I'm gonna take some questions. Um, I can put this back up if anybody wants to. So I'm going to have Olivia help me um, manage that. 
Thank you so much, Susan. I know that I'm feeling very inspired to bring all of these lessons back into our own community, maybe have a garden work party ourselves. Um, so I do have a few questions here and more are coming in. Um, Liv asked, does all of your growing end with the first frost or do you also cultivate frost tolerant crops? That's a really good question and it really depends on which method you're growing. So I, I, meant, I didn't get into it in detail, but in, in Hopi culture, uh, we do have an agricultural life cycle that's tied directly to um, our religious practices. And it is, so if you're, if you're farming, uh, dry farming, I mean, those are all actually warm, warm weather plants that we dry farm with. They're beans, corn, um, squash, pumpkins. Those are actually all warm weather. So they don't grow in the cold environment. But um, Hopi practices really dictate that we let the earth rest. We, we, don't, um, we don't grow and bother the earth during around the um, deep winter month, which would roughly fall around December area the time we follow a moon cycle actually. So um, there's some strong practices about bringing your yields in, um, letting them, making the time to dry and, and, and then putting them away properly before the, the cold winter season comes in. So all of that needs to be brought into the house because these plants from a Hopi perspective are not just food, they're actually part of your family and we treat them as our family. Uh, farmers go out and talk to them like they are our family. They engage and acknowledge them as part of our extended family. And when they're brought home, the women accept them as part of our family. So we, we, we actually give them a lot of regard and bring them in and store them properly before everything happens. So that's a really, uh, a real traditional way to look at growing food from a Hopi perspective. But how do you begin to do that if you want to grow food year round for yourself? Those are some of the larger cultural questions we're asking ourselves because, because of what you saw with the numbers, uh, the, the monetary numbers of going somewhere to dry, to buy food. Um, you know, we, we, should we be growing then kale, which is a cool weather crop, um, kale or lettuce or, you know, any of the brassicas or spinach, can we grow those in the deep winter months? Should we be growing those? Those are some of the, the real uh, cruxes of the, of the conversations we're having because it's, we don't want to disrespect who we are, but how do we, how do we, um, how do we do that or should we do that? And it's, it's really a, a bigger conversation we're having. So traditionally all our crops were warm weather and they did end in the, with the first frost. And then, um, and we didn't grow any cold tolerant crops until recently. Awesome. Our next question is from Carrie. She asked, can you talk more about mulch? Why use mulch? What type and how much? <laughs> oh gosh, you got to take one of my classes. I don't think I can answer all those questions appropriately. Um, our classes are virtual, so you're welcome to join um, any of our classes there since, since we can't meet in person anymore. But mulch really does serve a variety of reasons, I mean, the purposes. Um, uh, mulch really is, it's a blanket for those of you who don't garden and don't know, it, it really serves as a blanket um, on bare soil. And in Hopi, you know, we clear everything and then we add mulch. So what mulch does is it helps to, um, uh, allow the water to stay in the ground longer because it doesn't evaporate. Our, our, our sun is very strong. That's one of the things it does. And if, if, the, if the ground stays moist, um, then you have a lot more biodiversity in the ground. There's a lot more critters and things we can't even see that are doing a bunch of cool work to build soil. And that's what we want. We want to keep all those guys alive and healthy and create a good house for them because they do a lot of work for us. So um, adding mulch, um, helps keep the soil moist and as it breaks down it feeds all those critters and builds that soil. Um, it serves as a blanket if you want to to um, shield the ground uh, from the sun it keeps so a mulch a mulch bed will actually keep the ground a lot cooler in the summer than the top of the mulch bed and it will also keep the ground warmer in the winter. 
So I have carrots and beets in the ground that were planted last fall and we pick up to a certain point and now we can pick again because we can work the soil. And so I can, I can actually harvest carrots and beets from now till probably, probably close to April till it really starts warming up. But it's, it's actually, we actually got snow yesterday. Thank you for everybody at the beginning when you're introducing and saying we needed snow. I agree with you. We got some snow the other day, but um, the, the, it'll help actually help keep that, um, the ground from freezing and, and you kind of have to know your environment because how much mulch depends on how, how cold it gets and what's your frost you know option there's a lot more information we got to learn about that and how to use it um so come to a mulch class <laughs> you'll learn a lot more i welcome you <clears throat> I think I'm going to be taking you up on that in the future. Um, we have several questions re related to water. So maybe you can answer what the water yearly water cycle is like by you. And if you feel like you have access to an adequate amount of water for these irrigation systems that you're setting up. Yes. Um, well, a lot of people who will grow, um, who have backyard gardens will, will be connecting and using the water source from the community water system. And those, those systems truthfully are not designed, were not designed to manage the probably amount of water that gardeners will be adding to the load. They're really designed for household use. So that is a challenge we have in our community about promoting and supporting and having everybody grow a backyard garden, we're just going to be using more water. That's one of the reasons why mulching is so important because we want to use water wisely. We talk about drip systems because that's also a way to use water wisely. So we're, as we teach people about using water to grow, it's, I mean, because you can't grow without water. How do we use it wisely? How do we use it um, smartly? The permaculture group in our community is also educating and promoting a lot of people to catch water I've heard about that issue in Colorado. Here, we don't have a law. We can catch water. Um, it, it, takes, it does take some education, some investment in supplies, but we would like to see more people catching water and using that source to feed um, orchards and gardens. But truthfully, um, all the water, most of the water that we use come from systems that are have um, wells that are drilled very deep into the ground and use groundwater. There's probably only one village that's completely uses all the spring water. There's enough water from that one spring that they can use to feed their whole garden system. So there's a lot of work we have to do on that. Um, um, that certainly is one of the biggest challenges we have. <clears throat> Thank you. And we have a few minutes left. We'll try to get through a few more questions here. Um, Let's start with Liv asked another great question. She said, are boys more likely than girls to get involved with growing and how come, if so? Uh, that goes back, well, I guess it depends, it depends again what you mean when we say growing. I've tried to use dry farming and irrigated growing with, with my language and it's very purposeful. Going back to the uh, culture, uh, culturally speaking, Hopi culture is really uh, delineated into um, gender roles. We have females who are responsible and do X, Y, Z, and males contribute their part by doing, you know, A, B, C. And so, um, in culturally, how that works is it really does take both genders and both sides to support the larger activity of what we're doing. So when it comes to growing and, and um, growing food in the community, um, the act, the actually act of planting and growing the fields are actually given and designated to the males of the community to do. They have a lot of the knowledge that's available to, I mean, that they, they learn really hands-on how to do it. So when we, when I show the picture of the young boy, that's really, you know, where it starts. If you take your young the younger kids and then they grow up learning that. Um, once the yield is harvested, they bring it home and gift it to their wives if they're married. Um, if they're unmarried or young, they'll gift it to their mothers or their sisters. And then they then the women assume responsibility and then we take care of it and learn how to process it and learn how to um, store it and, and use it in all areas of culture. So 
So there, that's a way in which we honor both sides of our, or both genders of our communities to support the, the food growing. So if you're talking about dry farming, boys are more likely to be involved in that. But um, when, when it comes to, and that, that's how it is in my household, my husband manages our, and takes the lead in, in, in everything in the fields. I just tell him what I want planted and then provide the seed and then he goes and plants it and then takes our son with him. I go out when I can and I help as much as I can um, in that. But when it comes to the growing, um, it's just something that I like to do. And it's, I guess, culturally, more of the females did that part of the growing. But it's just something I love to do. And I think it's just important for any young person to know about some of that stuff. This is what a carrot looks like when it's still in the ground. And so I, I try to get anyone and everyone, and I don't necessarily pay attention to those generals because it's just so important. Food is so important to any family. But I think when it comes down to it, um, I had to learn this the hard way in that I love this work. I just cannot imagine not doing this work. And I can't imagine anyone not loving this work the way I do. So I've met a lot of people who like the idea of this, but realistically, it's just not part of who they are or don't, they don't want to make it a part of their lifestyle. And I've had to come to terms with saying, you guys are really missing out, but okay. You know, so I think sometimes it just comes down to, can I put my, can I put myself into this? Because it is work, no matter how much I love it, it is work. Um, and so sometimes it's just about how can you, you know, are you willing to do it? <clears throat> Thank you so much for that answer. It looks like we have time to get through just one more here. So Sheehan asked, what kind of companion plants do you encourage to preserve water and encourage symbiotic relationships? Oh, wow. Um, I'm still learning a lot about companion planting. So I don't know if I have a really good answer for this one. Um, but um, I think, let me see, I'm trying to find the question again, because there was a lot in that question. Companion planting and to encourage water, and what was it? And symbiotic relationships. It's in the chat box as well. Yeah, I'm trying to, oh, okay. And the symbiotic relationship. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think we could answer this probably again in two different ways. Um, both the dry farming method and irrigated growing. But one of the things I think we, um, we I'm kind of learning more about is um, maybe it's not so much companion planting, but the importance of perennials as well to, um, to, to, to I think it, what, and what they do is they, they even spread and I, I'm, I'm still learning so much about those. So adding perennials to your garden, um, adding florals and flowers uh, for increased pollination. Um, companion planting, I'm really just starting to learn that. I, I do companion plant, kind of the easy ones are tomatoes and basil. They actually like and support one another, um, root crops together, um, adding marigolds to brassicas. Um, marigolds, they're a flower, so they're, they're great because they invite uh, pollinators, they add so much color, but apparently the some other pests don't like the way they smell. So that's why we add a lot of, and I plant marigolds everywhere. Um, I don't plant as much flowers as I'd like to, but those are just things I'm learning to do. So I, I have a huge garden, probably it's too big because there's things like that I wanna learn more about that I haven't spent the time. So you're getting me there. I don't know really a good answer for that. I'm still learning, but if you do know the answers or have some suggestions, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for the wonderful questions. And Susan generously put her some of her contact information, Instagram website on some previous slides. So if your question, I know we could not get through nearly all of them this evening. Um, there were some really good ones remaining. So um, if you want to reach out and get a little bit more insight, and I'm really excited to be um, sharing all of this information with our community. So thank you again, Susan. Um, I feel inspired and ready to go. And I'm hoping for snow, but now also really looking forward to spring. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. And 
I encourage you guys to try if you if you haven't started and if you're growing food already, good for you. Keep it up. Invite more people to join you. I love to visit with you more. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you in a few weeks. Bye guys.